Well, welcome everyone to our event today on tactically responsive space. My name is Carrie Bingen. I'm the director of the Aerospace Security Project here at CSIS. It is a snowy day in Washington, so thank you so much to our uh, friends that joined us in person today, as well as the many folks that we know are online. I'm honored to have General Gutlein here today, the Vice Chief of Space Operations. Today is a two-part event, so this first part will be a fireside chat. We need the fire, but a fireside chat between General Gutlein and myself. We'll take a brief break, we'll come back, and we have a superb panel led by Sarah Monero and a thoughtful group of uh, government and industry experts in tactically responsive space. Um, I'd ask everyone to submit your questions, whether you're here in person or online. You can scan the QR code here or uh, go to our event website. There's a blue button there, ask a question. Um, before I introduce the general, I would like to explain the genesis of this event. Last fall, there was a new record set in space launch with the Victus Knox mission. Just 27 hours after receiving an order to launch, a government and industry team launched a satellite into low Earth orbit. These are timelines unheard of by government standards. Um, we'll talk about tactically responsive space missions, plans, capabilities, and challenges. But I'd also like to say, even before that, CSIS hosting a tactically responsive space discussion has been long in the making. And a driving force behind this was Mark Baird, retired Brigadier General, friend and colleague of both General Gutlein and myself, uh, who passed away unexpectedly this November. Um, for those that knew him, you would not be surprised that he called me on a regular basis to say, Carrie, you got to get moving on tactically responsive space. DOD needs to get moving. This is a capability too important to the warfighter. So with this event today, we honor his memory. So I'd like to introduce General Gutlein, second ever vice, vice chief of space operations, steeped in space acquisition, space programs, technology, former deputy director of the National Reconnaissance Office at the Missile Defense Agency, worked on numerous space programs throughout his career. I also didn't realize that you were a Secretary of Defense corporate fellow at SpaceX yes. during your service, which I think is unique to have that kind of industry experience, especially with that kind of disruptor. So that's great. And then also for those that know General Gutlein, he is incredibly personable, engaging, um, his, his energy is contagious. A five minute conversation can turn into a 15 minute conversation, 30 minutes into an hour. So we're just so pleased to have him here today. So if I can start, you're in a new job. Finally confirmed. When you assumed command of Space Systems Command, you said at the time, quote, this is going to be the most exciting and challenging time of my life. You're now vice. Any first impressions of the job? Maybe you want to amend that statement? Um, I, don't think, I don't think that time has ended. It is still the most challenging time of my life um, for many, many reasons. So let me start with, I, I greatly appreciate you bringing up Mark Baird. Uh, Mark was a, a visionary and, and definitely a change agent across the entire space enterprise. And, and it really was a, a tragedy to uh, lose somebody of, of his ilk. So I greatly appreciate you uh, bringing it up. And he did spur a lot of this conversation uh, early on about uh, being tactically responsive. So I appreciate that. Uh, as far as the job goes, uh, I'm still too new. I, I haven't been there long enough to really know too much about the job. Uh, but what I will tell you uh, more than ever is um, there's more going on around the globe than any, almost any time in my career. Uh, and there's more change simultaneously happening across the entire sphere, uh, especially in space that, that is exciting that, uh, that hopefully we'll get into and uh, talk about. Uh, the other thing that... Um, I'm seeing on a day-to-day -day basis is we have the highest quality of personnel, both in the military and in industry and academia and in our allies, uh, than at any point I've had to experience my entire career. So it really is a, an exciting time to be in this business when you watch it, the, look at the explosion of innovation coming out of industry, coming out of academia, uh, you watch what our allies are now bringing to space, uh, coupled with what we're doing within the department, it really is an exciting time. I couldn't agree with you more. So let's jump into tactically responsive space. I, I think my first question is, what is it? What do we mean by tactically responsive space? I mean, I would think the Space Force would want greater responsiveness across all of its missions. So what is it, what is it not, and why is it needed? Those are, those are all 
great questions and big questions. So if, if we start with uh, the stand up of the Space Force and why we stood the Space Force up in 2019, it was because space was starting to be contested. And we had uh, built a force across the entire department that was really optimized for efficiency in the Middle East. And what that meant from a space perspective is we were very, very dependent upon our space capabilities to, for the joint fight, but they were built for an uncontested environment. And as an uncontested environment, they didn't have a lot of protect and defend capability in it, and we weren't really building that into our, into our force that we were gonna present. You couple that with going into the, the, the uh, mid-2015 uh, timeframe, et cetera, space was hard, space was expensive, and space was complex. As a result, we tended to glob a lot of requirements on one platform and make these very exquisite platforms. And without a shadow of a doubt, the United States have built the most exquisite space capabilities on the planet. We have the best SATCOM, best missile warning, best position navigation and timing, the GPS, best weather, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so it was, it was working for us, but those systems, because they were so expensive, they took a lot of time to build. Uh, there wasn't a lot of tolerance for risk, so they had lots and lots of redundancy, uh, and, they, and, and just really made them expensive. But that also meant that we weren't really responsive to the joint fight on a tactically relevant timeline. A tactically relevant timeline is the matter of, 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 of weeks, days, even hours. And if you look at uh, the near peer competitors that we're looking at today, the fight could be over in a matter of months, if not weeks. So we no longer have the luxury of time to wait years, even you know, 10 to 15 years to deliver some of these capabilities. But our entire force was optimized around that business model. So tactically responsive space is changing that business model, refocusing the force on the way we do acquisitions, the way we do operations, the way we do presentation of forces to make sure that I can be tactically re relevant to the joint fight on a tactically relevant timeline with capabilities that the joint commander without a shadow of doubt can depend on for us to deliver and to operate and to protect and defend. So that we as a nation have an integrated deterrent value and we can deter aggression rather than having to respond to aggression. And can you maybe walk me through a scenario or scenarios where these kind of tactical capabilities would be needed? Because I, I guess I start to instantiate it. Is this reconstituting satellites if something's been uh, disabled? Is it responding to an adversary capability? Are we testing? new technology? Are we moving things around? Are we buying more commercial data? Like what, what's in that scope there? What are some so of the I would first start with one of the biggest uh, reasons that we always struggled getting out of the gate with anything tactically re uh, responsive is because we always use the word reconstitution. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to reconstitute the entire GPS constellation in a matter of hours. You're not going to reconstitute the, the, the missile warning capability that took us decades to deliver overnight. You're not going to reconstitute uh, MILSATCOM uh, in, a, in a matter of hours. And that's all true. But there are many other capabilities that we do need to respond on tactically relevant timelines. For example, when uh, another nation puts an asset up in the space, and we don't quite know what that asset is, we don't know what its intent is, we don't know what its capabilities are, we need the ability to go up there and figure out what this thing is. Is it something that I should be worried about? Is it something that should keep me awake at night? Is it something that I have a mechanism to protect and defend the rest of the force against? How do I do that? That's where tactically responsive space comes in. If a near peer competitor makes a movement, we need to have it in our quiver to make a counter maneuver. Whether that be go up and, and do a show of force, or that go, go up and do a space domain awareness or understand characterization of the environment, what's going on, uh, et cetera. If we go into an operation, whether that be for peace or, or for defense, and, and let's just start with, uh, we have a natural disaster that hits, uh, a tornado hits, a, hits, a, hits one of our states, and we need emergency SATCOM. We need the ability to put up satellite communications in a matter of hours to support our national decision authorities to get eyes on the ground. Um, if we have a hurricane hit uh, uh, another country, we need the ability to do the exact same thing, put up uh, uh, what we call tactically surveillance reconnaissance and tracking. So the ability to look down from space to understand what's the damage assessment of the hurricane, how, how bad is it, uh, uh, where do people need help, et cetera. Those are the type of capabilities that we're talking about being tactically responsive. 
It means that the national command authorities, our national decision makers, our combatant commanders, our joint uh, war fighters, and our international allies need something now today. They don't want me to all of a sudden put an RFI request for information out on the street, start asking questions, put out a draft request for proposal, a new final request for proposal, go into source selection, go into negotiations, and now we'll go build it. That's a two plus year cycle that I just talked about. I need to short circuit all that in a matter of hours. That's what tactically responsive space is about. And that cycles what you've been within your career. I've seen it through my career. Yes. Um, I, I've lived that cycle today. Uh, saying that I can do that entire cycle in two years is, is going fast on, on a national system, national level capability. Um, and that really is what our acquisition system is optimized about for space is because they were expensive, because space was hard, uh, we didn't want to take a lot of risk. So we dotted the I's and crossed the T's like nobody's business to make sure that I could guarantee that the national treasure that I was putting on orbit was going to work. Yeah. Now I need to pivot to a different mindset. That pivot to the different mindset is more like a MacGyver type ass, uh, my mindset. How do I take advantage of what I have, which is exploit what we have, or how can I buy what I can to get as much capability on orbit as I possibly can to support our war fighters, our national decision makers, and our allies? Okay, so then that brings us to Victus Knox. You know, I mentioned it was heralded as this record-setting thing. I mean, launching within 27 hours of receiving an order to launch. So beyond just that 27-hour mark, what made this mission so significant? So this, this mission broke all the paradigms. We challenged industry and the government that I want to be able on no notice bring a rocket and a satellite together. I want to mate them, encapsulate them, launch them, and have them on orbit and in operations in 24 hours. That was the goal I gave them. Today, that is a six to 12 month effort on a standard timeline. Six to 12 months. Once I already have the satellite ready to go, once I already have the rocket ready to go, that's six to 12 months. On Victus Knox, we asked them not to do that, to have the, not to have the rocket and the satellite together, but wait until I gave them the notice that we needed that capability on orbit. And then once I gave them the notice that, hey, we have a need, you've now got 24 hours to give me that capability. We were told it could not be done. Not only that, but because of our culture of being more in tune towards the expensive, exquisite systems, we, we were not even having an idea on how it could be done. How do I pull out the flight plan? How do I start doing the orbital dynamics? How do I do the weight and balance? Um, how do I guarantee that when I launch this thing, it's actually going to give me 100% capability on orbit? We didn't know how to do all that. Victus Knox broke all those paradigms. It, it, they didn't pull any of that stuff ahead of time. They didn't even know when we were going to launch. We didn't tell them ahead of time when we were going to launch. We were able to exercise all the way end to end of that process of what the operational unit would do, how the, the, our industry partners, which you'll hear about on the panel, are going to bring these capabilities together in, in a tactically relevant timeline, have it on orbit and have it in operation supporting whatever the need was in a matter of hours, not months to a year. So tactically, uh, Victus Knox broke all those paradigms and proved to us all, both government and industry, that it could be done. It proved to our adversaries that we have the capability to do that, which has a significant amount of inherent uh, deterrence uh, value to it. And it became the new standard upon which we're going to grade uh, new, new providers in the future upon. And what was striking to me when we had a conversation uh, a few months ago is, um, you know, it, it wasn't just exercising the rocket and the satellite, that there was this whole infrastructure that hadn't done this before. Can you kind of talk through that piece of this as well? A absolutely, because that really is the fundamental value of Victus Knox. It wasn't the space domain awareness capability that we put on orbit. It was really all of the the exercises, the training, the con ops, the, 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 the TTPs that we put in place up front that allowed us to do that capability that we can build off in the future. So going into this, I will tell you, we had uh, several operational exercises where we took the operational crews that are actually gonna operate this in, in, in a time of crisis or conflict uh, and put them on console. We actually had our uh, industry partners in the room and we ran these operational exercises, which, which isn't always done that way. The first operational exercise, we failed. Flat out failed on the first one, but we learned a tremendous amount. And we came back after a couple more of those, uh, of those cycles iterations and were able to start honing in our processes, uh, start getting those timelines down and to prove to ourselves that this really can be done. 
we, this is not no longer unobtainium. This is something within our grasp. And then you, you briefly mentioned culture here. I kind of want to come back to that. Is this really is a paradigm shift for how we do business and operations? So just uh, has that been a culture shock to the system? It, it has, it, and it continues to be. Uh, when we stood up the Space Force and we moved them, uh, we moved ourselves out of the Air Force into the Space Force. The force that we brought, that we that we generally brought across, was a service-oriented mindset, meaning that we provided the most exquisite services for the nation and the joint warfighter from space. Those services were never uh, contested. So our mindset was all about optimization, uh, all about efficiency. How do, how do I do that for the, at the best possible with the highest reliability? It wasn't about, hey, how do I meet the tactical timelines on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis? So we have been going through a series of exercises, reorganizes, restructurings, conversations about how to re-optimize the Space Force to get after that tactically relevant timeline, to get after how do I do presentation of the forces to the Joint Force Commander? How do I get the Joint Force Commander to understand that space can be there and space can be depended upon in a fight and no matter what you do, we will be there providing you the most exquisite capabilities on the planet. And then how do you work even further upstream? So policy requirements, acquisition. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's a lot of what Victus Knox brought to the table is when we started talking about how fast we wanted to do this, we got, we got sort of being told, well, you're not going to pull the spectrum allocation. You're not going to pull the, the orbital uh, uh, slots. You're not going to get the FAA flight certification. There's a whole lot of things that, that were barriers in front of us from a from a, a traditional launch perspective that are people saying you just can't get through. Victus Stocks broke all those paradigms. So we not only proved to ourselves from an acquisition process perspective that I can take something off a production line, repurpose it, and then be ready to launch it. I not only proved to myself from an operational perspective that I can launch within 24 hours and have an operations and do with operational crew, but we also proved to our stakeholders and our decision makers that I can go through the entire decision making uh, process to include pulling all those permits in a tactically relevant timeline. Well, and then, I mean, tactically responsive space has the potential to be kind of everything to Absolutely. everyone. I guess, how do you decide what to prioritize? Are there gonna be certain mission areas or capabilities better suited to this and maybe some that, that won't? How do you think about that? Absolutely, so if you back up and look at uh, the way we're approaching acquiring new capabilities today, it's exploit what we have, buy what we can, and build only what we must. And what do we mean by that? It means that I no longer have the luxury of time as a nation to build everything that I want. I no longer have the national treasure. Uh, I no longer have the most exquisite IP. Uh, and we've now got to change that paradigm. So under exploit what we have, it's, there's a lot of capability we already have on orbit, uh, both organic to the government, uh, organic to industry, or organic to our allies, that I can repurpose, network, integrate, and, and use in new and innovative ways that we never thought about to get more capability tonight for whatever the, whatever the need is tonight. Beyond that, we've seen an explosion of innovation both out of industry and out of our allies that I don't no, no longer have to go build it myself. I can actually rely on industry, rely on our allies to bring that capability to the table. So under that umbrella, it's buy what we can. I wanna buy as much as I possibly can before I have to go build it. But at the end of the day, there are still missions that we're gonna have to build. There are still capabilities that are not gonna be resident in industry, resident with our allies, there's gonna be capabilities that we need that are gonna actually take a few years to do research and development, uh, to do testing and get on orbit. So I still need to go build those capabilities. But what I want through that entire exploit what I have, buy what I can and build only what I must mantra is this tactically responsive space mindset. The reason we are here is because the nation needs the space capabilities that we provide, both for peace and for defense. That's the why, that's where we've gotta start with. And everything in my psyche as a Space Force member, as a guardian, needs to be about how do I provide that capability? What can I do to get it there tonight? What can I do to guarantee it'll be there tomorrow? And what can I do guarantee to, to do to make sure I have competitive endurance in the future with a credible capability that's gonna give us integrated deterrence? So organizationally, does it require standing up a dedicated program office and team focused on tactically responsive space is a measure of success that just becomes part of every PEO? Like, how do you think about that piece? So it is definitely not standing up a program office. Tactically responsive space is not about building hardware. Tactically responsive space is not about launching uh, uh, 
rockets or, or building faster rockets or bigger or smaller or any of those kind of rockets. Tactically responsive space is about a culture shift within the United States Space Force to get the entire set of guardians thinking on tactically relevant timelines. How do I get a capability to the combatant commander on tactically relevant timelines, guarantee that capability will be there and it can be relied upon in times of crisis or conflict, and then figure out how I'm gonna guarantee to protect and defend it going forward? And then how do I also make sure going forward I can modernize my capability to remain my competitive edge to give us competitive endurance? Because the, 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 the opposite of competitive endurance is, is being in a state of conflict. And we don't wanna be in a state of conflict. We wanna always deter aggression. That's what an integrated deterrence is all about. So the more credible force, more credible capability I can bring to the nation, the more integrated deterrence we have. Well, and so as I, I wanna then talk about the, the way ahead here and what that demand signal looks like going forward. Uh, I'm gonna hit this in two different ways. The first I'll say is on scale and pace. To date, the Space Force has conducted, I'll say basically these one-off demos. You had TAC-RL, you have Victus Knox, Victus Hayes is next in the pipeline. Yep. Congress has been supportive of doing more here. Um, I'm actually gonna ask a question from one of our interns here at CSIS. We have super interns. Jeremy Tamelio is actually a Harvard. Okay, so I'm gonna remember Jeremy's name. He's a, this is really cool, sorry for the tangent, but uh, just graduated from Harvard with his master's and wrote his master's mm -hmm. thesis on tactically responsive space. So Why isn't he up here? <laughs> we should. Well, here's his question. So to achieve Space Force's goal of an enduring TAC-RS capability, I think by maybe 2026, do you expect these demonstrations will keep becoming more frequent, more technically complex? You know, what are you going to be testing? What are you going to be doing next? How do you get in a, a more, more of a cadence here? Yeah, absolutely. Great, great question, Jeremy. Um, so first and foremost, let me go back to tactically responsive space is not about the hardware. It's not about the satellite. It's not about the sensor. It's not about the rocket. It's about the mindset. It's about the culture. It's about building in the CONOPS, building in the, the TTPs, building in the uh, rapid acquisition system, building in the advanced training to make sure that we can be responsive on tactically relevant timelines. So, so that's really where it all starts. So as you look at what we started with TACRL2, TACRL2 was focused on launch. How do I shorten that launch cycle? And we got that down to 21 days under TACRL2. TACRS3, which was Victus Knox that we just did, was all about breaking all of the, the, the process timelines to make sure I can do it within 24 hours. Again, bring the two assets together, the, the, the satellite and the launch vehicle, made them, encapsulate them, launch them, have an operation in 24 hours. It was to prove to ourselves, Victus Knox was, that I can do that. And we did it in 27 hours. Why did we do it in 27 hours and not 24 hours? I love that question because it's about physics. We had to wait for the Earth's rotation to come back around to put the satellite where we wanted. Industry and the government would have beat the 24 hours if it hadn't been for physics of the Earth's rotation. That's a great problem to have. So we had, we had a lot of time with that. If you look at the next one, uh, Victus Hayes. Victus Hayes is about continuing to break those paradigms and to show how we would rapidly put up a space domain awareness capability and operate it in real time against a red threat. What would that look like? What operational unit would do that? What do those authorities look like that I need to be able to go off and do that? How would industry respond it? Does, it, does the Space Force need to fly that satellite? Or can industry fly it and instead take direction from the military? How does that CONOPS look like? What type of operator do I need to be training in the future to be able to do these responsive capabilities? We will get that all out of uh, Victus Hayes. Beyond Victus Hayes, there's Victor Soul, and that takes us into 26, and then we'll, we'll continue to, to press the, the test button. But all of these TAC-RS missions are meant to continue to polish the CONOPS that we're gonna operate under, the, the crews that are gonna operate these capabilities, the authorities that we're gonna operate on, the processes to get the clearances, how do I do advanced training, what does that end-to-end -end dot MLPF process look like to give us an enduring capability for integrated deterrence. So the other piece of this, and, and you hit on this briefly here, is it's the, do you buy a service? Do you build something bespoke? So, all the above. So if I go back to that MacGyver concept uh, and, and, and the exploit and the buy, if I can get it and it already exists in the world, I don't wanna go build it. So under tactically responsive space, it might be through the commercially augmented space reserve that I reach into industry 
and I repurpose an asset that's already on orbit. It might be that I reach into industry and I take something off the production line and I repurpose it like we did for Victus Knox. It might be that I already have capabilities stored on orbit. It might be that there are some capabilities that we want to store on the ground so that we have rapid access to them. Tactically responsive space is all those concepts together wrapped up into a mindset and a culture change with the United States Space Force. I'm going to jump around a little bit because there are some really good questions here to weave in. And then I do want to talk about some other, um, some other issues in your portfolio. Um, but I, I've had a couple of questions here on, this sounds an awfully lot like operationally responsive space Love that from question. back in the day. So what's different about now? Um, it, so it goes back to what I talked about why we stood up the United States Space Force. Operationally responsive space really was pre-Space Force concept about how do I have a warehouse full of assets stored, a warehouse full of rockets stored, so that if there was some type of crisis, whether that be man-made or natural, I could actually start doing some kind of replenishment. Um, ORS was kind of cha chasing, chasing that dream for many, many years. And what we kept running into under operationally responsive space was a couple things. First of all, space was hard at the time. Space was expensive. The federal government had the majority of the space capability within the nation. Not, it was not at the time resident within, within industry. Um, in order to make that a reality, we had to uh, devote an enormous amount of national treasure to storing those kind of capabilities. But yet, because it was expensive and it was hard, we were still very risk adverse. Mm -hmm. and, and we weren't really willing to, to go as fast as we possibly can. All of that fundamentally changed when we stood up the United States Space Force in 2019. From the ground up, the threat has changed, the technology has changed, the posture of our, uh, of our industry partners has changed, the posture of our allies has changed. Uh, everything that uh, tech or that operation responsible space had stacked against them is a different operational environment than what I have today. And I remember working on the legislation at the time and we had a really great operational problem to solve support the combat commanders but just the technology wasn't necessarily there. It was too expensive at the yeah. time. Yeah. Um, I, I also want to hit, you mentioned international, so there's a question from Fritz Brower from the European Parliament. How can U.S. defense leaders work with European NATO allies to build, strengthen, and deploy tactically responsive space capabilities? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, again, I go back to it, it's a mindset, and it's a mindset that we're actually talking to our allied partners about today. Um, the one thing that has really kind of changed our calculus in space, in addition to the fact of the, the technology maturity and innovation coming out of industry, is the fact that we, in space, it really is a different war fighting environment. When we went into the Middle East, I could quickly tell you who my combatants were, who my non-combatants were. I could tell you who my allies were, who my uh, other government agencies were. Um, all of that was kind of in front of us, and we knew each one of them had a different status of, of forces agreements, and different sets of rules of operations, et cetera, and we understood all that. Going into space, it's a completely different environment. We're all operating in the same environment at the exact same time simultaneously against the same man-made and environmental threats. And I can no longer draw a, a bright lid line between, hey, these are the international assets and the US assets. These are the commercial ones and these are the civil ones. We're all operating together in the same environment but because we're now starting to network and integrate everything in this new environment, everything's networked and integrated together. So you can't draw a bright red line upon what is, what is friend and what is foe. Take it to the next step. Our near peer competitors have already come on the world stage and said, every one of us is a threat. Every one of us is a target. So if that's gonna be the case, now I've gotta start getting unity of effort across all these disparate different groups, especially our allies. Our allies are bringing capabilities to bear on orbit. We need our allies to be part of the joint fight. We need to incorporate them into all the conversations that we're having. And we're trying to break down those, those barriers as we speak on a day-to-day -day basis. That's really good to hear. Um, I, I wanna broaden the aperture a bit here. And you can answer these as former SSC commander or, or in your, your new hat as well. But you, know, you talked when you were at SSC about being laser focused on getting new capabilities into the hands of operators by 2026 to counter China. So can you discuss a little bit about what, what you anticipate seeing from China in the next few years, TACRS and beyond, what that means for SSC, what it means for the Space Force, but also, I mean, 2026, two years away, what does that near-term preparedness look like? Yeah, I, I would say, first of all, I, I, a conflict with China is, is, is not uh, 
a guarantee, right? If we do our job and we have integrated deterrence and we provide the most exquisite capabilities out there, hopefully we can deter any type of aggression. Um, really the 2026 uh, vision is that we need to maximize the amount of space capability that we can put up there to support the joint fight to make sure that no other nation on the planet is emboldened enough to challenge us on a, on a, on a, on a force on force kind of construct. Um, we need to make sure that nobody feels like they have to act out of desperation because of whatever's going on across the world, kind of like we're seeing in Ukraine, uh, that we can prevent and deter that type of, of conflict. So 2026 is really about maximizing the amount of capability that we can bring to bear to the joint force com component commander uh, and the combatant commanders going forward. And when you think about that time and urgency, you know, I guess there's a dichotomy in our space architecture. So much of what you know, we do from an acquisition perspective at SSC, you know, we're still buying some pretty, pretty exquisite large systems. A couple. Yet, uh, and we have to deliver on those. You have some of these newer program, or newer capabilities, like, right. like the, some of these TACRS demonstrations, shift to proliferation. So, so how do you kind of manage and deliver on both of those pieces? So um, it, it, it's a challenge. If you look at how we were organized pre-Space Systems Command, we were organized uh, among a small number of PEOs. We started with one and then we went to three and then now we're at uh, a handful. But those PEOs pre-SSC were focused on delivering systems, systems of record. And they were incentivized to deliver the most exquisite systems possible that met the requirements on cost and schedule. They were not incentivized to deliver a capability that could be depended on by the combatant commander or national command authorities. That may sound a little bit, a little bit odd, but it really was trying to optimize space for efficiency. Um, it wasn't about trying to deliver the most exquisite capability possible to the combatant commander in an integrated manner. So when we stood up Space Systems Command, it really was a shift in mindset to where now I have capability-based PEOs. I don't have a Sibbers PEO, space-based infrared. I don't have a GPS PEO. I don't have a MILSATCOM PEO. Instead, I have a remote sensing or an all, a, a sensor communicate, a, a PEO whose entire job is to worry about the fight tonight. How do I sustain the capabilities that I have? How do I modernize incrementally those capabilities? And then how do I deliver the, 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 the system into the future for integrated deterrence? One PEO now owns that entire life cycle of that capability and is laser focused on delivering that. In the Space Force, we are now also bringing in greater partnership between operations and acquisitions. So that my job in acquisition is to solve the operational problems of my operational commander. How do I bring them and align them more, more closely together? So as we look going forward under the Secretary's Great Power Competition, it really is about how do I re-optimize around the joint fight, re-optimize around the combatant commander, and get that horizontal integration across the entire enterprise to get after the fight. Well, and integration, that is so important in my mind. I mean, if we pause it, hey, we've got to be ready come 2026, 2027. And I, I agree with you. I mean, we, we, we have a vote in this and, and there are things that we can do on the deterrence front. But in the space world, it places a premium on what's in the toolkit that we have today. Correct. Or, or I'm sorry, what's in the toolbox that we have today. Uh, and that is, that means we need focus on integration. How do we integrate the commercial, the international, some of these new, new, new uh, capabilities coming online rapidly. So uh, on commercial, I, I want to touch on, I mean, you have this mantra, the, the mantra we talked about, you have a mantra, exploit what we can, buy what, or exploit what we have, buy what we can, and build only what we must. I mean, I'll say many have been critical that, that Space Force leadership is saying the right thing on commercial, but that the programs and budgets don't necessarily match that rhetoric. So, so can, can you talk or address that, that critique, maybe preview a little bit about what's to come in 25? Um, so let me start with the capability PEOs are to guarantee a capability. And in the guarantee of that capability, it can be an exploit by build mm -hmm. mantra. Under, under exploit, they're actually reaching into the legacy systems and saying, hey, how much juice for the squeeze can I get out of what is already up there? But then I also want them looking at buy what I can, both internationally as well as commercially, domestically. And that, that's a different way of looking at the problem because 
I now need to partner, which is, gets a lot into the integration you're talking about, partner with our industry brethren to figure out how do I bring more capability to bear uh, in support of the nation. I might bring it to bear under commercial services. I might buy it commercially. I might repurpose it. I might rely on industry for, for analytics. There's a whole host of capabilities that we can uh, uh, rely on industry to, to bring to the table. What it really comes into at that point then uh, is, is what we're calling unity of effort. And, and that's really what's missing from the conversation here a little bit is we are all classically trained on unity of command. Unity of command means that what's on my shoulder means that's the authority I have and I can tell you to do it and you're gonna do it and you're not gonna ask me any questions, right? That's unity of command. There are many times where we need unity of command. But when you are working across the interagency environment, when you are working uh, hand in hand with trying to integrate commercial uh, capabilities in, into the fight, I can't tell commercial what to do. I now have to negotiate with commercial. I gotta have a conversation with them. I gotta have to have a partnership with them. That's where unity of effort really comes into play. So under Space Systems Command, the first thing we did was space, stood up the, the System of Systems Integration Office under Dr. Claire Leone. Her job is to really look at how do I integrate horizontally across the space enterprise, both internally to SSC, but then how do I partner external to SSC with the Space Development Agency, Space RCO, NRO, MDA, and the list goes on of, of, of agencies that are building capabilities. But then she also has international affairs and she also has commercial uh, space office under her uh, umbrella as well to be figuring out how do I do that horizontal integration. Then how do I now start structuring those partnerships so that I can have a relationship with an industry partner that says, I'm gonna bring you in, uh, we're going to collaborate on an exercise, these are the standards that I want you to be able to deliver, the interface standards, network standards, what have you. And long as you can do that, you'll be a part of our solution, part of our capability, and then we can provide that end capability. But I've gotta have that integration up front that you're talking about. And it's integration both technically, that the systems talk to each other, integration organizationally that we understand the language we are talking about and we understand when I say I need you to go left what that really means. But it's also that integration across the entire interagency landscape that I can deconflict and rely on each other during times of crisis or conflict. Well, and I think traditionally in the space community, I mean, program managers, they, 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 work, they like the satellite side. Um, you know, now as we're getting to these proliferated architectures, we have so many commercial capabilities coming online. You know, you're working on integration, you're working on networking, autonomy. That's not, that's not the, 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 the glamorous stuff, right? So, no, but it's, it's and the bread and butter. You don't like it's to the, fund it, but that's, yeah. That, that's where, that, that's where the, 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 the rubber meets the ramp, is really in the integration and the networking. And, and I can deliver you the most exquisite capability possible on orbit, but if it doesn't integrate and network into a broader enterprise, it's gonna be useless and it won't be there when I need it. Yeah, that's great. So then, uh, culture of innovation. How do you think about innovation going forward in the Space Force? And I mean, I think there have been critiques against the Department of Defense writ large in terms of, are you really, are you doing innovation theater or are you really embracing this culture of innovation and inculcating it into you know, your missions, your organizations? I, I would say we are, we are really uh, inculcating it into the organization from the ground up. Um, and it goes back to where I started. The level of competency of our guardians, our airmen, our industry partners, our allies, our academia is, is off the charts, uh, greater than I've ever seen. Uh, and, and there's a lot of great ideas uh, coming out of these younger generations. There's an enormous amount of innovation coming out of industry every single day. Uh, industry is doing things that we never even thought were imagined. Industry is repurposing technology from the medical community into the space community, or vice versa. So innovation is just all around us. So it's, it's more than just theater. It, it's really fundamentally there. And what we're trying to do under the guardian uh, mindset, the guardian ideal within the Space Force, is to give our guardians the opportunity to uh, voice their opinion, voice their ideas, build their ideas, experiment, take risks, Fail if you must, because you're gonna learn more when you fail, and then not kill you when you fail, not, you know, not discipline you. And how do I reward that type of behavior? Or how do I highlight that behavior? And there's so many pockets of it. Uh, we have uh, the space super coders now. So we're teaching our guardians how to be super coders, uh, building new software applications for the squadrons. So if they see they have an idea, 
we are giving them the tools to be successful. We have innovation labs at Patrick where you can come in and actually use 3D printers to build hardware if you have an idea. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the TAP labs out in Colorado Springs, which are the techniques, applications, and processes labs, which are three data lakes. I have a data lake uh, focused on space domain awareness. I have a data lake focused on uh, 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 OPIR, uh, infrared. I have a data, data lake focused on, space to, uh, on tactically surveillance, reconnaissance, and tracking data. And we are providing those data lakes to not only our guardians, but to our industry partners and our allied partners to say, come play with our data. We will mentor you on the data. We will give you access to the data, whatever classification that you're cleared to, or at any point in the processing chain. And if you can build a capability that has value, we will immediately paint you a path into operations for that capability and figure out how to reward you for that capability so I can take advantage of it today. So it's much more than just theater. We are embracing it every single day and it's paying huge dividends across the entire Space Force. I think that tab lab you mentioned, that's so key to just bring, bring people in. Absolutely. Here's the data, bring people in. And, and you know, prior to the Space Force, we held all of our data very, very close at very, very high classification levels. And, and we only gave you a peek under the tent when we needed something. Now I'm trying to expose the, the, the data to the maximum extent possible so that you can innovate on that data. Okay. I'm going to shift here to more, more questions from our, our guests here. So Sandra Irwin, Space News, I saw here uh, in person. Are we going to see a shift to alternative PNT systems? SSC's commercial space office has been doing some market research. Um, do you expect the face, Space Force to, to fund or to pursue alternative PNT services? to augment or supplement GPS? Yes, there, there, so there's, for, for Sander, there's a lot of effort in this umbrella of alternate PMT. Uh, alternate PNT from space, alternate PNT from the ground, alternate PNT from other, other data sources. Uh, we really are exploring the entire gambit of, of alternate PNT with the end objective of making sure at the end of the day, we can guarantee without a shadow of a doubt that the nation will have exquisite position, navigation, and timing for everything going forward. And right now I use that term PNT and not GPS because it really is the PNT piece of it that becomes the key. The PNT piece of what comes off of GPS today drives our entire economy. It drives our entire international financial markets. It's how we get goods to the shelf, airplanes off the ground, ambulances to your house. PNT is driving all of that. It's not just that image that you get on your phone. It's much more in depth than that. And what we want to do is make sure that we can guarantee it that if that signal ever becomes uh, 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 attacked or becomes vulnerable or something nefarious uh, in the, in the uh, uh, natural environment happens, that we can guarantee that there is an alternative way of getting you that PNT signal. So we are researching across the, the entire gambit, both taking advantage of commercial services, international uh, capabilities, as well as alternate technology. So we had a chance this morning here at CSIS to meet with the inaugural Space Force class of intermediate learning um, oh, from education John Hopkins. students. They're here at Johns, uh, Johns Hopkins. And it was very much a joint force. I thought it would be just Space Force officers, but it was really representative across the services, including a, a German student as well, which is fantastic to see. But Major Kelly Caggiano, who's a student at Johns Hopkins um, with, with the Space Force programs, asks, the warfighter on the ground thinks in terms of minutes, not hours. Absolutely. Back to your point on tactically responsive. With that in mind, how do we adapt space capabilities to allow for real time or near real time support to the maximum extent possible? So in order to do that, A, we have to understand that I may not give you the most exquisite capability right out of the gate. Um, my job really is to make sure you have the, the minimal viable product that you need to progress whatever operational is that you have. Uh, then I have to guarantee without a shadow of a doubt that I can protect and defend it and it's gonna be there when you need it uh, and, and you're gonna depend on it. Um, we are doing that through partnerships, partnerships with industry, partnerships with, with uh, international. Uh, we are doing that through uh, commercial exploitation. We are doing that through alternative sourcing. And then we're also doing it through the tactically responsive space culture change that we're going across the entire force. So that when I think about it from a MacGyver kind of perspective, which is means how do I throw everything at it plus the kitchen sink to guarantee that capability, that's how we're gonna get that down to minutes uh, down from what currently could be years. Okay. 
Um, next question is from Teresa Hitchens from Breaking Defense. And I apologize, Teresa, I think I may butcher this. Um, the Commerce Department just made awards for commercial data to populate their space tracking system. Given that SDA is foundational to tactically responsive space, does DOD plan to utilize data gathered, uh, generated through the track CCS as a low cost way to expand its own SDA data gathering, or perhaps uh, draw lessons learned from how that data is synthesized? So I, I can't comment on, on what the Department of Commerce is doing. That's kind of out, outside of my lane. But under space domain awareness, what we're doing with the uh, joint commercial uh, uh, operations cell, and I'll come back to what that is here in a second, and what we're doing with the space domain awareness uh, tap lab, uh, we are really trying to take advantage of all data. So if the Department of Commerce or any other agency or international partner or whatever had data that we think of has value, we want that data. So we are not uh, 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 opposed to that. We definitely want it. Uh, under the JCO, the Joint, Cap the joint commercial, op or commercial Operations Cell that operates out of Colorado Springs, that really is a commercial operations floor with commercial providers providing space to parent awareness off of commercial sensors. We bring all that data down, we integrate it, we make use of it, we pass it over to operations, but we also share it with our allies. Any space domain awareness data that we can get our hands on, whether that be commercial, international, we want. So I would imagine that as the Department of Commerce continues to mature this concept, we will definitely want to take advantage of what they're doing. And we are today sharing all of our data, all of our systems, all of our capabilities, intellectual capital with the Department of Commerce. Okay, I'm gonna ask you two more questions here. First one from Rylan Weigel from the private sector. Have you found any technologies or capabilities that you would like to see industry expand the use of oh. that would best support some of the new goals of the Space Force? And I'll expand upon that as you think about tactical responsive space. What do you really want to challenge industry to do here? Um, for, for industry, I, I want, so let me go, but first of all, the technology. The technologies is an easy, easy answer right now. The biggest thing that we're in demand right now is uh, cyber defense, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and quantum. Uh, we, we know that that is the uh, next generation of systems and capabilities. We know there's a lot of research and development happening on the industry partner, uh, industry side, academia side, allied side and we wanna bring all those ideas to bear. So that's the technology side. But if you get back to everything else you just said, and, if, and hopefully the team, when they get up here and have this panel, we'll talk under Victus Knox. Uh, it really was, we wanna hear their thoughts on how do I short circuit the, the approval processes to be able to get these capabilities into service faster. What can you do to, to increase my training and readiness level? What can you do to short, to short circuit the delivery cycle? What can you do to uh, help me with the analytics to make more sense of the data that we're already bringing down? Anything that industry can bring to the table, we want industry to bring to the table. I wanna come back and maybe end on culture. Uh, I, I've internalized this quote, MacGyver mindset. So, okay, we're guardians that, that, are, that really embrace this MacGyver mindset. Um, so if technically responsive space is about a mindset shift, and this is from Patrick Zaytuni from Hawkeye 360. How do you think about driving that enterprise-wide change to really instill it across the board, across every PEO, SSC, you know, coming in across the Space Force? We are looking uh, across the entire Space Force under, the, under this, how do I re-optimize for great power competition? Re-optimize is key. I'm currently, I was optimized for a Middle East type uh, event. Now how do I re-optimize for great power competition? Under re-optimization for great power competition, I want every single one of our guardians laser focused on the objective. And the objective is to provide a competitive endurance for the nation to make sure we have an integrated deterrent capability which means I need a credible space capability that nobody on the planet wants to challenge. And nobody has any doubt whatsoever that it will be or will not be there. That is a mindset shift that we want within the entire uh, Space Force. And that mind shift means take advantage of everything you possibly have at your disposal, whether that be technology, whether that be the way we're organized, the way we train, the way we equip. Uh, how do I bring all of that to bear to optimize that solution at the end of the day to guarantee integrated deterrence. Well, I think that point is a great way 
to end our discussion awesome. today. John Gutlein, I want to thank you so much. There were many questions that we just didn't get to, but I think it shows just how much interest there is. Um, we wish you the best of luck thank in you. your new role. Um, and you have so many folks here, here in person across industry, our international partners, uh, other think tanks. Um, They're here to help and support what you're doing. So thank you very Excellent. much. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you all for attending.
Hello, my name is Clayton Swope. I am the Deputy Director of the Aerospace Security Project at CSIS. Before we kick off this panel, um, let me put in a quick plug for another event we're having next week um, on January 24th. That event is around Air Force priorities in an era of strategic competition. It will be a moderated discussion with the Honorable Kristen Jones um, performing the duties of the Undersecretary of the Air Force and the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs, Lieutenant General Richard Moore. Um, please see our website uh, for more information and if you'd like to register to participate. So the next part of today's two-part event is a panel discussion with experts from DIU, Boeing's Millennium Space Systems, Firefly, and Northrop Grumman to discuss the Victus Knox mission and explore the past, present, and future of responsive space. So let me start by introducing Sarah Monero, the moderator for today's panel. Sarah is a non-resident senior associate for the Aerospace Security Project at CSIS. She is the founder and CEO of Tanagra. Yes, that is a Star Trek Next Generation reference. If you were wondering, I asked Sarah today. Tanagra Enterprises, a national security and technology consulting firm. Over her career, she has worked in the private sector, the executive and legislative branches of government. She was the staff lead for the Strategic Forces Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee and a senior advisor to former HASC Chairman Mac Thornberry. She also served in OSD policy and the office of the Undersecretary of the Air Force for International Affairs. Sarah started her career as an intelligence analyst at NASIC in Dayton, Ohio. Um, over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for everybody joining and braving the uh, winter of Washington, D.C., coming a, a little late, but still beautiful, quite frankly. I'd like to um, specifically just thank CSIS for hosting this event, for General Gutlein for taking time out of his tremendously busy schedule to be here, and to all of our participants on the panel. I mean, this is a really important topic. Uh, for those of us that have been following operationally responsive space now for years, watching its development and its growth into tactically responsive launch, watching these demonstrations as they go through, and the development into tactically responsive space. I mean, it's really a culmination of a couple of decades worth of work, right? And this is a mission set that, like a couple of other really interesting, fascinating mission sets that the Space Force is looking at right now, things like on-orbit servicing, things like commercial integration, are really existential to how the Space Force will function in the future and how it will fulfill its mission to secure our nation's uh, interests into and from space. And to help us kind of think through that and specifically through the tactically responsive space, we're joined here by a great panel of industry and government partners. And that is so foundational, as we heard previously, about making sure that the culture and the mindset that we're trying to achieve with tactically responsive space helps benefit not only our industry partners, but helps to ensure all of the mission requirements and needs and culture development of the United States Space Force. To be honest with you, um, I've met all of these gentlemen in various uh, iterations of my former and current life. Um, probably under less smiley circumstances than they find themselves right now. And so it's a pleasure to actually share the stage with them. I am going to let them introduce themselves, their organization, and their role in this mission set. And then we'll kind of go through moderated questions, both some that I have here, but again, would encourage questions from this audience and the audience that is participating online. So we'll start with you, Brett. Thank you. I'm Brett Alexander. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of Firefly Aerospace. And Firefly is the company that took the uh, Victus Knox payload uh, and launched it within 24 hours on our Alpha rocket. Um, that, as General Gutlein had said before, that broke the paradigm of how fast uh, launch could be done. Uh, we had practiced that in terms of pulling together the team, making sure that things that could be done in parallel were done in parallel instead of in series. Uh, that we were practiced and ready, uh, and we were able to execute that mission uh, within the 24-hour timeline. Uh, we then waited three hours and conducted the launch and put the spacecraft uh, right where it was intended. So uh, we're very proud of that. Um, and then on our next launch after that, three months later, 
we were able to beat that timeline uh, and, and conduct everything in, in a 19 hour timeline uh, right before we, we scrubbed for weather, but uh, we were on pace to beat that 24 hour timeline, so. Jason. Uh, Jason Kim, I'm the CEO of Millennium Space Systems. We're a uh, small sat Constellation Prime contractor based in El Segundo, California. Um, a little bit about that in a second. Uh, we were the prime contractor for the space vehicle as well as the ground system and mission operations for the Victus Knox mission. Uh, we absolutely loved the partnership with Space Safari, the Aerospace Corporation, all the Guardians, and Firefly Aerospace. Uh, we were very privileged to work with you. Uh, it was a strong partnership. Um, I think the things that we focused on at Millennium to move fast uh, and set a new standard, as General Gutlein then mentioned, uh, for the rest of the industry is uh, we took a, a spacecraft off of an existing production line. Um, so that was, that was critical to moving really fast and delivering the, the space vehicle in eight months. Um, we also are vertically integrated, so we build about 80% of what goes into our spacecraft. And so that helped a lot with being resilient with the supply chain challenges that you, everybody uh, is facing these days. Um, and then um, I got to say that uh, I absolutely agree with what we heard in the prior session with Kerry and General Gutlein. Uh, I've never heard it uh, so eloquently stated that is, it is a mindset shift. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned El Segundo. I'm, I'm privileged to be right across from uh, where General Gutlein was running and leading Space Systems Command. We're right there. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of elite performers in the El Segundo uh, city. General Gutlein was one of them, and he mentioned it was all about mindset. Another little known fact is we're right next door to the Los Angeles Lakers. If you look at <laughs> elite performance, you look at someone like LeBron James, and you would have asked LeBron James early in his career, how are you performing? Oh, because I practice, I outpractice everybody, and uh, you know, I'm physically ready. You ask him now, he will tell you it was his mindset that helps him perform. And so I absolutely resonate wholeheartedly with what General Gutlein said. It was the mindset and the partnership with everybody that really got us through Victus Knox. So happy to be here. David. Uh, happy to be here as well. My name is David Ryan. I'm at uh, the Defense Innovation Unit. We're an acquisitions organization joint under uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense. I'm also a guardian, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Yeah. Kurt. Hey, Kurt Everly. I'm here from Northrop Grumman. <clears throat> I'm the Director of Space Launch, and uh, I'm located here in the D.C. area, uh, right next to the Washington Wizards, <laughs> which... Oh, oh, wait. All right. Forget it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we, uh, we launched the, uh, the Antares, the Minotaur, and the Pegasus uh, launch vehicles in my, in my group, Space Launch. Uh, but we're part of a bigger launch vehicles organization that does a lot of targets work and interceptor work for missile defense uh, and so on. And so uh, we were able to draw critical avionics and other components off of a hot production line and, and bring them over into Space Launch for, for our vehicles that we use uh, to do our launches. Uh, back in 2021, we used Pegasus to launch the tactically responsive Launch 2 mission, TACRL-2 mission uh, from Vandenberg uh, on Pegasus, so it's an air-launched vehicle. We were able to fly out and launch within two seconds of the optimal launch time to get into a particular orbit plane. And so, as General Gulein was saying, the physics of it, to get into a particular orbit plane, when that plane comes overhead, you need to launch into that orbit plane. Um, air launch could allow you to get to that orbit plane uh, quicker than just waiting for the Earth to spin around. So that's another interesting feature that, that we could bring to the table. Happy to be here, sir. Yeah, awesome. <coughs> Look, um, we're actually, I'm going to take the next question. I'm going to start with you, Kurt, since sure. I started originally with Brett. But from each of your perspective, what was the one thing that really surprised you about executing these kinds of missions that was kind of different or unexpected? I find in, in every role that I'm in, I end up learning something, and it's always learning something that I never anticipated I was going to have to learn. It supposedly has made me a better person. <laughs> Debate. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I think, you know, TACRL2 was uh, procured kind of in a typical uh, procurement uh, methodology, and uh, General Gutlein was talking about how do we speed that up. And I think 
that was really hard. Um, uh, being able to have a, a subcontract barrier to the space vehicle provider, so whenever, any, whenever anything changed about the interface, it had to go through a contract letter and so on. And so there was just a lot of you know dragging everyone along. Hey, if we're going to do this, we've got all got to we got to hurry up. Um, we got to get that contract letter out the door so we can operate uh, you know under the contract to get the next phase of integration done. Uh, similarly. In this country, we like to uh, protect the public when we launch rockets, um, which is great, and we have an excellent safety record for all the rockets that we launch. Um, but that means a lot of coordination with range safety. And, and typically, range safety, we deliver a lot of uh, products four months before launch. It's typically when you deliver the final products, the, the, the trajectory and the dispersed trajectory, where, where all the parts could fall if you had a bad day, and so on. That had to radically change with Space Launch Delta 30 at the Western Range. And, and to their credit, they, they came along with us and they, and they figured out how they were going to do this within 21 days. Uh, we got the phone call uh, when we are going to launch and it told us the final orbit. So we had to quickly generate the trajectory products that we normally take months to do. We, we had it nailed uh, quickly in a couple days, got them to the range and then they approved them quickly. So, uh, you know, of course it was, from a, it was from a bounded set that we had already kind of predetermined that, that generally this launch was going to be uh, towards. But still, that was a real upset uh, of, of prior precedent. Um, and, and I understand Victus Knox just you know, took it from there and, and just shortened things up further. So, so you know, we in industry, we can do our part, but we have to, you know, these demos are really important for dragging along the whole process. Uh, and then, you know, one of the things that surprised us uh, to your question was uh, in the range approval process, there's a collision avoidance um, analysis that's done. Uh, to make sure that we're not going to hit something in our launch. And we had, a, we had given ourselves, uh, I think it was a, a five-minute launch window. So uh, there's an optimal launch time in the middle, and then you, you have enough energy to steer your way to, uh, to the right orbit if you launch within you know, two and a half minutes on either side. Um, the range uh, didn't have the capability to quickly analyze that, that collision avoidance, so Aerospace Corporation actually came in and saved the day and was able to implement that, do that analysis to their satisfaction. They discretized the five minutes and they did a bunch of analyses and, and, sure. and again, ensured the safety. So, so maybe that's, a, you know, that's something that surprised us, but also looking forward, how do we, how do we uh, pre-analyze or pre-clear uh, these launches to specific trajectories or specific orbits um, and, and maybe the, the safety bar has to be lowered just a, just a hair to be able to do that from, from how we've been. Uh, and I think, I think we can still achieve the, a good result. Awesome. David. Yeah, so DIU started working with uh, Space Safari uh, while Victus Knox was already under contract. And so I think a big surprising uh, thing for DIU and working with Space Safari and SSC has been that change in the mindset and that unity of effort. And the, the reason why Space Safari and DIU started working together um, as, as we've proceeded through Victus Hayes is due to our different understandings of the acquisition cycle and taking the best practices from both and putting them onto to future missions that we're going to work on together. But that change in seeing how they were able to quickly turn from an, uh, an idea over the course of a year and be able to execute that as quickly as they were able to um, with that unity of effort and that mindset change, it's, it's been surprising and it's been a really welcome um, thing to occur because we've done it on other projects within DIU, but nothing to, I think, the operational relevance and uh, timeline that we've seen with anything except for Victus Knox to date. Great. Jason. I think Victus Knox for us in technically responsive space uh, was a, a, a very uh, good lesson, um, you know, learning a lot of good lessons from it. Uh, both expected and unexpected, more so from the unexpected. Uh, you know, talk about contingency planning and rehearsing and having a plan for a backup plan for a backup plan. Uh, we went through all that. And, um, you know, that's why they call this a trailblazing mission. Um, and because we've, we've done it together already, uh, we know that we could do it again as a nation. Um, but we also know how we can do it better. So there's, there's time I want back to shave off during an on-orbit checkout. It was, we did it in 37 hours. I think we could do it faster than that. Um, you know, the 24 hours, I think that's, that's something that we, we demonstrated minus the 33 hours of the, the earth catching up like General Gutlein schooled us on. Um, but there's a lot of things that we, we could do a lot better next time. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to say, uh, use the word surprise. Um, 
because I think the key to what was uh, so successful about Victus Knox was collaboration. And it was collaboration between government uh, and industry and industry partners themselves. Mm -hmm. But there are many parts to government. There are many parts to uh, the Space Force with the range, with the program office, with the spacecraft uh, folks, as well as the, the launch vehicle folks that, that, that work all of that. And everybody came together with that singular purpose of, of making the mission a success, demonstrating it, uh, making sure that the timelines worked and, and the practices and all that. Uh, and so you had multiple shifts. You had uh, people that, uh, that came out for all of the reviews uh, and that followed everything. And that collaborative spirit is not what I've seen in my 32 years of, of experience working with the government every step of the way. Uh, you do see that a lot, and that is a key to success. And everybody brought that mindset to this effort for Victus Knox, and that, that really was the key to success. You know, measuring success for these kinds of things is always really, really difficult, especially when it is not just about an objective of getting a, a satellite or, or something specifically in an orbit, but it's changing the long-term muscle memory, the institutional uh, kinds of um, habits and culture associated with this mindset shift, right? We've looked at this a lot today through kind of the national security and the military lens, but as representatives of people uh, that are you know, in industry or work closely with our industry, I mean, what are the commercial industry benefits of these kinds of missions where they're stretching you and pushing you towards more collaboration and pushing you down a path that quite frankly, you know, government is, is challenged to let you move beyond? I mean, what is the commercial incentive there and what does that landscape in, kind of look like for you as commercial entities? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that in that, um, as I said before, you know, with Victus Knox, we were able to demonstrate the launch within 24-hour timeline of integration and, and getting uh, ready to launch, to push the button. On our following launch, we did it in 19 hours to get to that point where we ended up with a weather scrub. Um, that capability was done, you know, was pushed we were pushed to do that for national security, for that demonstration, um, but we are maintaining that capacity and that uh, capability through our commercial activities. Uh, and the commercial sector wants that. So they're not gonna want to go back to something that is, okay, we're gonna take six months to do this. They wanna know that, that we can still do it on that same timeline. Now, that's for a, a, a regular customer that doesn't necessarily need that responsiveness. There are other commercial customers now that do want that responsiveness and can change their own business plan of how do they reconstitute satellites or how do they um, you know, access orbit. Uh, and so they now have that as an option. So that has allowed us to, to, to diversify our offering uh, to the private sector uh, to the benefit of, of you know, our business as well. Okay, anybody else? I would just uh, add on to that that you know at Millennium we're we're a hybrid company you know we focus more on national security space, and we're very much aligned with how Boeing thinks about this. Uh, tactically responsive space is just uh, another um, you know method within the Boeing integrated space order of battle um, to remain resiliency. You could have large satellites working with proliferated multi-orbit small satellites to gain that kind of capability. You could have um, commercial working with government, uh, but TACRS is another way to flex, right? It's a, another avenue to be resilient. Uh, what we proved on Victus Knox was we could meet an urgent need, so speed was the metric. Um, but I could see how for commercial uh, service providers, you know, the faster you can get a capability on orbit means you can generate revenue sooner, so that's good for your business model. Uh, this, the people that get the service also get the service. Right? We talk a lot about direct to sell these days. Mm -hmm. So people in rural areas that don't get anything will start getting data sooner. Um, and you know something that I've heard, you know, Bill Weber at Firefly, uh, their CEO, say is uh, we shouldn't have to be dependent on when a launch vehicle is ready a year from now or so. Uh, you know, these commercial entities, they should be able to launch when they need to, when they want mm -hmm. to. So there's, there's a lot of value to this tactically responsive space, even to the commercial world. Okay. Anybody else want to take that? Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just uh, offer a little counterpoint. I think 
you know, Virgin Orbit um, was in business for responsive launch, and they went bankrupt. So I think they were hoping to see, you know, more of a commercial demand signal mm -hmm. from, you know, from wanting that, you know, specific launch, when you, you know, responsive launch capability, and it didn't happen enough. Now, um, you know, maybe this, maybe it was just a, you know, the timing was wrong or, or, or so on. But, uh, you know, I think, I think, you know, the transport emissions that the SpaceX is doing is, you know, is grabbing up a lot of these, these uh, commercial spacecraft that, you know, that don't, I mean, that's, that's basically, I will wait for a launch because the price is right. I will wait for whenever that big launch is going to happen and I'll, I'll just ride along. So, so I think we see that, we see those market dynamics too. And so, um, you know, I think, I think it may be that uh, to get what we need, we may have to be more focused on it than just, just uh, plucking it out of uh, commercial industry. Yeah, I mean, that partnership, I think, is integral, and it's something that I think the Space Force, again, is one of the, it's at the heart of how the Space Force fulfills its mission. And there's a, a couple of these big existential questions right now, and wrapping your head around kind of commercial, commercial services, how that interplays with the provision of capability is still outstanding and, quite frankly, is going to be determined not only by the really robust commercial offerings and industry that we find in innovative U.S. based kind of small companies, uh, but is also going to be found in other uh, co-equal branches of government in their, in their funding. And so I think that will be interesting to see. Um, one of the things that we talked about a lot was, you know, TACRS and the, the definition of what TACRS is. Is it kind of a mindset? Is it mission capability? Is there a prioritized set? You know, in general, Gutlein, I think, kind of helped to really define that and, and kind of draw that out. As we look at the application of that, of that mindset, for those guardians and for multiple different kinds of mission capabilities. I mean, what does TACRS kind of look like in various um, orbital regimes for different mission areas with the strategic vulnerability of our kind of spaceports? And Kurt, this is something that you talked about as well. You know, the reality is, is that you can only launch certain things from certain places. It, this is, ladies and gentlemen, this is still rocket science. Uh, and it is still darn hard. Um, but that impacts the availability of the architectures in the future. Have you guys given thought to this about kind of how that looks and, and how you would play into those multiplicity of kind of architectures that you may be asked to fulfill in the future? Why don't we start with David? I haven't heard from you in a while. So I think that we are looking at the broad spectrum of all of these solutions. So of course, uh, within the framework of TACRS, we're going to be looking at exploiting what we already have. And that's not necessarily going to apply to um, working with commercial companies all the time, but on occasion it could. If there is an ability to um, actively work on, on a contract to exploit a service that is already in existence, that would be something that we would probably want to look at, as well as uh, different areas where we could launch from. We have to look at the entire spectrum as a service and as, um, as the government in order to be able to deliver a solution for what is right for that, that particular um, issue. And in doing so, we would be contracting for, for the things that we need to um, exploit or, um, or, or <laughs> contracting for the things that we would need to buy or exploiting things that we already have on orbit or uh, looking at uh, building things that maybe aren't necessarily commercially viable. Okay. Jason, you look like... I'll jump in here. Okay. So, I'll, I'll be so I, you know, we, we have, um, you know, I, th I think we're looking, I think, at least, at least I am, and, and see what you guys think, but uh, I think in industry, we're looking for the government to define what is the capability. And I think, you know, these demos are certainly helping, I, I assume that they're helping to kind of flesh out the, the, the program space that we want to operate in. Um, but I think one, uh, one approach might be since, you know, I think industry can launch things to LEO, industry can build s spacecraft, industry can, can fly the spacecraft even from our own control centers. And, and I, was, I was interested to see General Gutlein uh, bring that up earlier about, you know, do we just hand over the spacecraft or we let industry maybe fly them and deliver a capability, uh, whatever it is, um, maybe that's quicker, um, faster to get that capability uh, to the warfighter. Um, so I think uh, we're looking for, you know, 
you know, one approach could be to define, here's the capability we want, here's the timeline we want it, um, and we want this flexibility, and, you know, and if you could write that down and challenge industry, maybe we just respond with, here's how we would, here's how we would provide that. Let us go off and, you know, we would, you know, maybe Firefly would partner up with Millennium, and, and here's an integrated capability we're delivering. We're not going to turn anything over to you, we're just going to give you pictures, we're going to give you video, we're going to give you plots, we're going to give you something, this is the capability you want on orbit, done. Um, and I think capability, I think industry has that capability now, we're mature enough uh, to do that. See what you guys think. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Kurt said, you know, flexibility, anything that allows um, the Space Force um, and other government agencies to have more flexibility is a good thing. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've thought about it a lot, you know, the spaceports. Uh, we've flown things at, uh, I think, all of the spaceports in the nation. But you run into things like, you know, um, you have to do all those things like COLA and range safety. And uh, there's a lot that goes into uh, each launch. And, uh, you know, things like, you know, getting fuel there. Um, there's, there's just a lot. And, um, you know, like you said before, it is physics related. So, you know, each one of those ports is based on where you want to get something to which orbit, which inclination, and we all know that those latitudes uh, are closer to the inclinations you want. So um, having more diversity in launch ports, uh, I think, is a great thing. There's a lot of D DUI-sponsored um, uh, companies out there that are looking at different type of spaceports. The more uh, flexibility we have in launching from different latitudes, I think, is a good thing. We mentioned uh, General Barrett earlier. I think the last discussion I had with him was on that topic ability to launch from anywhere around the globe to in, into any inclination. I still, that still resonates with me. Um, and then once you get up there, um, you know, you want to avoid the element of surprise um, for the U.S. Space Force. So, you know, geo is interesting because uh, there's not a lot of diversity in geo. It's, yeah. it's, you go to zero degree inclination or, you know, plus or minus a few degrees uh, inclination from that. And then there's 360 longitude. So you have the opportunity to launch uh, a lot of stuff at one time responsibly. So think about a tactically responsive space mission to GEO where you're launching a constellation of things to go serve an urgent need. In, in low Earth orbit, you don't get that luxury. There's a lot of diversity, a lot of inclinations, a lot of different altitudes. And so you kind of have to go get a, get a dedicated launch to a specific orbital parameter. By the way, Firefly just knocked it out of the park for us on Victus Knox just dead on, um, but you kind of have that kind of constraint. And then medium Earth orbit um, is becoming uh, a very valuable orbit. We're doing missile track custody for Space Systems Command. It's in MEO. Um, it's kind of a, a little bit of both. Um, you know where you're going in terms of altitude space, mm -hmm. um, but there's still, a, there's still some diversity, so you have to send a few tactically responsive space missions, whether it's the GPS orbit or, or some other MIA orbit. So um, you brought up a good point. I, uh, you know, that's, that's what keeps me up at night, thinking about all the things we can do tactically, in a tactically responsive space in all those orbits. You know, Firefly is an end-to-end -end space transportation company, right? So we, we launch, we land, we orbit. We want to do all of those things responsibly. The definition of responsive means something different to different customer sets. It's different for national security than it is for commercial, but we want to be as responsive as we can for every one of those customer sets and what they need. Uh, the ability to move things that are already in orbit, move them around, uh, or go refuel them when they need uh, more lifetime, or uh, the ability to launch something into orbit um, responsibly that, that comes off of a production line. There are different capabilities needed for each, each sort of customer set. On the national security side, there's really two basic types of responsive capabilities that are needed. One is you know, getting up there to do a mission, as General Gutlein said, a specific mission to go look at a specific asset that might be new in, a, in, in an orbit. Um, that's one type of thing where you're launching responsibly uh, a capability. Uh, and the other is, you know, having things that are on orbit uh, that can be responsive to a, a need, a tasking, uh, whatever that is, either by just maneuvering um, or by 
actually moving to a different orbit or by refueling or doing something. So you have the launch part, you have the orbit part. Uh, landing we do uh, for lunar landers, um, but eventually for landing back on Earth as well. Um, and those things, again, you want to be responsive to the customer needs. Uh, and as that, you know, um, the timeline of things becomes, quote, more responsive or shrinks down, uh, the more you can do with those capabilities. You know, one of the things that I think we've all been kind of talking around in this panel is, you know, it's one thing for commercial co companies to operate on a tactically responsive timeline because they're commercial companies. And it's another thing to get the government to be able to facilitate commercials moving on a tactically responsive timeline to be able to support them. And at this point, you know, what are the biggest barriers or challenges that you guys have as commercial companies in trying to meet the responsive timelines that are laid on you by either national security requirements or other government agency requirements that are, you know, quite frankly, the long poles in the tent here for you, other than, you know, physics <laughs> and the rocket equation? I'll start off. Um, you know, we, we, it used to be that you couldn't launch a rocket until the weight of the paper equaled the weight of the rocket. That was, <laughs> that was a hard and fast rule. So, um, you know, there was an airworthiness certificate process that we underwent on TACRL 2 that launched back in 2021 um, that, that was quite onerous. You know, it's a lot of paperwork. You do the work, then you have to, you know, deliver, have a bunch of deliverables, and then you have the government ask a bunch of questions and so on and so on. Um, you know, I, I just don't think there's time for that. I think they realized it, and I think Victus Knox had a different paradigm in terms of, uh, as I understand, talking to the Firefly crew, in terms of rocket, you know, manufacturing deliverables and the emission assurance piece and, and cranking that back and getting it to a, to a better footprint. Um, I think that's where we got ahead. Um, an example is, you know, that we've, that we've participated in is the cargo delivery, cargo resupply program for NASA, where NASA determined, okay, uh, we have enough confidence in industry that we're not going to buy a spacecraft or a launch. We're just going to say, we're going to give you some cargo on the ground and you guys deliver it to the astronauts on the space station. And so we, we have our own spacecraft, we own a rocket, we figure out all those interfaces, we actually fly it from our control room uh, and drive it right next to the space station where they grab it with the, with the robot arm and, and so on. So that allows NASA to just, you know, hey, industry, hurry up, uh, here's where we're going to launch and then uh, we'll see you there. So here's the cargo, deliver it on orbit. So I think. I think that really sped things up because it allowed us to just move as fast as we could without, uh, you know, of course they had some insight into what we were doing and they had to ultimately approve the launch, but, uh, but it's different than a certification process. And I think, I think that mission assurance piece, we've got to strike the balance of giving the government enough insight that they're comfortable uh, that, that we're going to have a good launch or a good, good chance of a good launch um, while still enabling the speed. I think that within the Space Force, the, the unity of effort and, and the unity of command, working more responsibly between SSC, DIU, that process is becoming more accelerated. It is very, I think it is more responsive than it's ever been. Now, the government as a whole, uh, there has to be a little bit of, of work together, and that is part of that uni unity of effort. From all of these uh, demonstrations, uh, all of these companies have learned new things and it's been passed on. They're, they're competitors, but they're also collaborators, and they're all part of the same industry, and they want the same things. And I think it's gotten better every time, and it'll continue to get better. Okay. Um, I think Victus Knox, the pur one purpose of it was to, to, to break, see where you break, where the process breaks. And so we, uh, but we still didn't get a pass, right? Just, I'll just point to security and cybersecurity. We, we don't get a pass because we're doing tightly responsive space mission. In fact, mm -hmm. it's even more important. And so, um, you know, just working with all the coordination that has to get done, um, all the packages, ATO packages that have to get done, just getting ahead of that and working closely with everybody and, and just responding to any need there, that's, that's an area that um, was, was very challenging, but um, we got through it because of the partnership. Um, logistics, contract, contracting, things like that, you know, fueling, I mentioned contingencies, I knew this was going to be an issue, so I made sure our team had three different approaches to fueling. You know, there was an on-base fueling, um, you know, option. There was a traditional contractor option, and then there was a small business option. And guess what? The small business was the one that, in the end, 
uh, God had done for us. Uh, so there was that aspect of it. But I think what I observed during mission operations was very, very revealing. I saw the guardians using critical thought as opposed to using checklists all the time. And I think that was the biggest observation I had where we can continue to drive tactically responsive space timelines is the warrior mindset. Just like General Gutlein said earlier, it's all about the mindset. Having that warrior mindset and the, the warrior ethos from prior to doing this mission to during this mission and then on orbit, um, because you're asking yourself, if I'm in a war, would I wait to do these 10 checklist items? I know, I've done the analysis. We're good here. We need to make this decision really quickly. We've done the analysis. We, we have the courses of action. We have the recommended plan. Let's go execute it because we don't have time. And I think that was uh, very, very revealing for me. Okay. Okay. I, I would just add that I think if, if we, Firefly, had tried to do a 24-hour responsive launch for commercial customer before it was done for national security, it would have been much harder. Again, it's that collaboration that we had everybody lined up to support that. Um, and we were then able to do it again later for commercial. But I think if we had tried to do it commercially alone, it would have been much harder. So the regulatory environment, the, the rules environment, uh, all of that, uh, you don't want to cut corners, but you want to streamline it such that um, uh, we are able to move quickly through that on a responsive timeline, whether the customer is government or commercial. Right. We're going to move uh, to questions that are being submitted uh, both here in person and online. So you can scan the Spiffy barcode that looks like modern art and go ahead and submit those, or you can go to the website and go and find those there, that link available. Um, the first one is from Umar Ahmed Badmati uh, at the Irregular Warfare Initiative at Georgetown University, and this is specifically for DIU. So it says, DIU has been pushing for small business involvement in DOD technology acquisition. Are smaller contractors inherently more rapid in terms of technology fusion and or deployment in attack RS or Victus Knox scenario? I would say that DIU does not have any preference for small or large companies. It's about targeting innovative solutions and capabilities. Um, what, whatever is being developed and is going to be ready, that is going to be ready on an operationally relevant timeline. So what DIU is looking for is putting these technologies uh, in the hands of our operators within 18 to 36 months, usually closer to the 18 month range. That is uh, the technologies that we'd be looking at. So for sometimes that is going to be a smaller, medium-sized company. Sometimes that means that that company would have to pair up with a larger company to make it a full uh, spectrum capability. Okay. Um, this question is from Robert Drods, who is apparently a ringer and is with the, <laughs> the United States uh, Air Force A5, which is actually a really important organization when thinking about planning and mindsets and long-term culture development. The question is, how are we progressing across industry to standardize hardware and physical configuration to accelerate spacecraft design and production and integration across different lift vehicles to increase flexibility and responsiveness? There's a lot there. It's totally written by an A5-er, <laughs> if you've ever written, read any I'll let a spacecraft guy I'll start with handle the spacecraft, that first. Right? pass it off to the launch folks. But, um, <laughs> yeah, Millennium, we've... Uh, we decided you know, 23 years ago to become modular open system architecture compliant. And so that's what we are. You know, the 30 plus uh, in-house components we build are all MOSA, just ask aerospace. Um, and so because of that, you can mix and match those different vertically integrated components to perform different constellation missions. And then we've uh, been very, very diligent in creating multiple robust production lines of different types of diverse missions. And so that's how we were able to pull on Victus Knox from one of those active production lines. Um, but another thing is we work closely with, you know, Northrop and Firefly and all, you know, the ULA, SpaceX, everybody that's out there. We're very much agnostic to the launch. Um, we work with them on the SEP system and the interfaces and we rehearse with them. 
we do all the modal analysis together. Um, you know, that's been a, a great uh, relationship with all the, the providers out there. And, uh, you know, I think we'll continue to do more of that. Um, but that's something that we are very keen on, the interoperability of our systems with uh, other systems, existing ground systems, commercial systems. Um, there's a lot of commercial ground C2 companies that are popping up and there's not enough, uh, you know, press on that. Uh, at some point, you know, our ground infrastructure is gonna be limiting. And I think having a discussion about adding more commercial ground C2 providers to augment that is, is a great way to uh, be more resilient, great way to be more responsive and also increase our coverage overall. I would say that the trend toward modularity, interoperability, standards, et cetera, um, has a long way to go. There are a lot of different standards. There's a lot of different um, modular systems. Um, that said, it is trending in the right direction. It is necessary. Uh, we, at some day, will get to the point where, you know, intermodalism like you have on, you know, shipping cargo, where it goes from a train to a, to a, a, a ship to a, a road truck, um, you know, I would hope to get there in space. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly need that for the in-space transportation capability to be able to go up and uh, through uh, uh, rendezvous prox ops and, and, and docking activities, grab something that you want to do, uh, you know, move it to somewhere else if that's uh, what the customers asked you to do. So those types of standards for all the different piece parts uh, are, are being actively worked and, and we need them to, to get there. Yeah, I love this point about ground because even though I have been a hardcore space nerd for 20 years, I think I have gray hair because I've been a hardcore space nerd for three years. And you know, quite frankly, it's one of these things where I get it, like launch is very exciting, getting stuff on orbit is very exciting, but at the end of the day, getting it down to the ground and getting it closing that last tactical mile to that user is very, very important. And so the commercial offerings that are coming there, I think that I personally, as, a, as somebody who watches this industry and watches kind of TAC RS, I think that will be the, one of the biggest long poles in this tent of, of closing this loop is how are you doing ground in the context of TAC RS, making sure that those capabilities are not just being uh, fused, but also being distributed out to the edge to where they need to be. And I think that will be fascinating to see. So I, I love kind of that discussion. Here's another question from, um, from our audience. Uh, this is from Mike Moran at uh, Terran Orbital. What does industry need the United States Space Force to do differently or the same to acquire tactically responsive capabilities across the entire space industrial base and all the mission capability areas. That's a big order. Uh, and I know you're only in DIU, so I'm not gonna throw you under the bus like that, buddy. But if you guys want to kind of speculate on what that would look like, all of you, to help a brother out up here, that would be appreciated. I mean, what do you guys actually think, you know, the priorities and the capability need to be to make the successful transition to this mindset? I mean, I will start. I do think it is the cultural shift more than anything. We, and the reason why the cultural shift in the mindset has happened, I think, as quickly as it has is because it resonates. Industry understands it, the government understands it, and especially the Space Force understands it. It's gonna resonate, and that's what's gonna be able to drive us to identify those capabilities very quickly and, and move the, the whole of the effort kind of toward that until you know, all of these capabilities for responsive space are at different maturity levels. We all understand that. Certain things to, to deliver things to different orbits is going to be at a different maturity level than launches. And as we identify what is less mature but that we need for the operators, that is what we are going to focus on with that unity of effort, I think. Okay. Industry perspectives? I think, I think we need money and clear requirements. I think, you know, mm -hmm. I, back to our earlier discussion, I think... Industry has all this great capability. Satellites are being launched by the hundreds. Um, constellations are going up with all this capability that are completely commercially funded, commercially built, commercially flown. Um, so I think if, if, uh, if, if government's able to coalesce around, hey, we want, we want to be able to deliver this capability within this, this time frame, 
and we want the flexibility to change the payload, you know, so many days before launch, um, and we want to stand that up in, by 2026. I, I think I think industry can respond to that and deliver that. As as Jason was saying, things are modular. There there are I think there are defined interfaces. ESPA Ring is a great example that mm -hmm. the Space Force has, has led up, or the Air Force originally, uh, to where you know a lot of launch vehicles have space for secondary defined secondary slots. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know, and we've we've built a spacecraft out of those ESPA Ring called ESPA Star. Mm -hmm. um, so I think industry has created all this capability. I think we just got to define it, well, define the capability we want have the funding for it, and I think industry will be able to provide it, confident. Okay. Jason? I love the fact that the whole industry right now uh, is scaling up okay. and ramping up high volume manufacturing Millennium. We stood up our small sat factory. Uh, it's uh, putting us at rate, um, so we're delivering um, a higher rate at, for our constellations now. Um, and Vic does not just prove that you could take something off the line, uh, so we know we could do it. Um, to put it in more practical terms, I would recommend to the government that every single contract that you, you put out there for the, these type of uh, high volume manufacturing companies um, to add a special study. And uh, in that special study, you get a number of hours just to study what it would be to do attack RS mission using that active production line that you're already on contract for, and then preload it. And you could easily, if, when there is an urgent need, execute that into a flight program. So that, that's just one, you know, potential, you know, practical method to do that. Okay. I think the challenge for Space Force now is to move from demos to an operational system or yep. paradigm, right? Where we're launching 12 times a year and instead of building a rocket for a tactically responsive space mission that sits around and waits, you take the rocket that's next off the stack, yeah. right? They are already coming off the production line, just like the spacecraft, and you're able to preempt somebody and say, hey, this one needs to go now for a national security mission. We'll fly you next week, right? And you can just take that next mm -hmm. rocket off. But going from a demo uh, once every couple of years, the next one, Victus Hayes, will be 18 months from now, the next one after that, another 12 months, let's say, it has to go from that demo to a, an actual effort that, you know, feeds whatever capability is needed operationally. Yeah. Uh, and that, so acquisition strategy, as boring as that term is, that's the currency of the realm, right? Yeah. No, I, I really, that resonates very strongly with me. Uh, it will not be a surprise to anybody. Uh, requirements and acquisition, um, because I'm apparently a masochist, are things that really interest me intellectually, but are also the bedrock and the foundation of how this government works and how this government needs to interact with industry. And a lot of what we end up doing at CSIS, you know, throughout the community is really being that translator function between industry, between uh, the government, um, and sometimes, dare we say, the Hill. Um, and that's fascinating, and it's a lot of fun, uh, but it's also very challenging. Uh, the Space Force, and this is kind of picking up on a, on a thread and a topic that all of you guys have talked about, but you know, the Space Force has just started kind of beta testing these integrated mission deltas, where they're trying to bring ops and acquisition and training and ISR, and they're trying to bring those closer, because I think what they've found is, quite frankly, that if you bring the ops and the, and the acquirers closer together, you might be able to have more transparent or at least quicker conversations about actual mission capability requirements as opposed to JROC validated requirements that may take you know, GAO says upwards of 836 business days to, to organically create, but who am I? Um, thank you, GAO. But, um, I mean, is this an area that you think, you know, is TAC RS an area that should be looked through or experimented with in that integrated mission delta kind of construct? You know, bringing those kinds of communities closer together. I mean, I think that that has already been answered by General Gutwein, and the answer is no, this is going to be a whole of effort uh, capability. So I don't know if it should necessarily be brought in as, as a delta, but this should be the mindset and shift. So I'm not going to disagree with that answer in the slightest. 
I like how you like check over there, right? You're like, I provided an answer. Slyly, was that correct? Yes. Th you're still here. You're yes. Fine. No, I, I think it was the correct you. answer. I, I absolutely don't think that a new uh, specific uh, mission only focus on this should be created. This should absolutely. Reorganization and creating new, creating yes. new organizations is always the correct answer. <laughs> Says the lady who helped write the legislative proposal that ended up making the Space Force. So. I stand by what I previously said. <laughs> <laughs> you stand by your previous remarks, and we love that about you. And, and I, I really do think, picking up on that, though, that it's, it's the capability end, right? Each mission delta should be about a capability that's needed, and therefore that tactically responsive mindset ought to be in each of the ones that is appropriate for it. may not be appropriate for every mission delta but, or capability, but it is for a lot of them, and that mindset and that acquisition strategy being close to the operator, being close to the, the developers, needs to all be, you know, together. I agree. Okay. Yeah, I want to pull a thread out of that because mm -hmm. I agree with uh, everyone. But the, the operator mindset, I think that's very valuable. In Millennium, we're end-to-end, -end, so we have mission operators that are trained to operate our satellites. We learn so much from mission operations. You know, did we design this the best way? We learned something where there's a gap, so next time, all of those lessons are get fed back into the early design cycle. And so, you know, you've heard of design for manufacturability and test. That's what mm -hmm. we're doing. But I think there's such a thing as design for manufacturability and test and mission operations. So there's so, so much learning. So if there's a way to get Guardians to get more operational experience flying, you know, large satellites, that's more routine these days, small satellites, it takes a lot more planning and coordination and there's, there's less time to do what you need to do to maneuver without regret. I think if you can get every single guardian to experience that, that's gonna go a long ways towards that warrior mindset that we're all talking about today. Awesome. Um, I mean, I think this has been a, a fascinating discussion. I wanna just close with a couple of kind of quick fire shots. At, at each of you guys, because I know, I know that you're up to the task. <laughs> um, it, the commercial industry folks, if you could tell uh, the Space Force one thing that would make your life easier in being able to provide these capabilities to them, what would it be? What would be the one thing that you would tell the Space Force they could do to make your commercial case for supporting them even better? Shift from demo to operational. What capabilities do you want and go acquire them? It sounds so simple. I love the answer, <laughs> yes. I think uh, a push towards system reliability. Uh, we're seeing a lot of proliferated architectures now, um, and a lot of these systems are Class C. I think a shift more towards that mentality um, could really help with cost, schedule, performance, um, you know, I think rather than just unit reliability. So that would be my biggest ask. Okay. Current? I, I would say, um, you know, uh, I, I think to unlock industry power, you know, we're constantly asked, what's the business case for that? Mm -hmm. What's the business case for that? So uh, if Space Force, as, as Brett said, if Space Force is able to outline, this is the capability I want, this is when I want it. And if you offered a guaranteed number of missions or a guaranteed amount of work, if you bring that capability, then that would close the business case for us. And that would unlock uh, private investment and capital uh, to bring to bear to the solution. Okay. For the solo government person uh, on the panel, um, what would you like industry to know about the challenges and the opportunities of working with you to be able to bring about this mindset? I think that working with the government is a bit easier than what it's always pushed out to be, right? There, there is a competitive nature to getting to that next set of contracts and, and, and a procured or uh, I guess to a POM or anything like that. We are prototyping things because it is early stage, because it is innovative. And sometimes that means that things are going to fail. But 
that means that we're failing early and we're still going to learn information from that. And I think that it is still a good opportunity to work with us. Um, and it is more similar uh, than to working commercial to commercial than it ever has been. And I think that we should keep looking at all of those opportunities. And what is going to succeed and what's going to support the operators is going to be what uh, is selected. Okay. Um, look, I think this has been a fan fascinating panel. I want to thank you guys all personally for checking out here in the snow. It looks like it might have halted a little bit, so I think we'll be okay. Um, it has been my personal and professional pleasure to know all of you guys in various kind of roles throughout my career and to have you still sit up here with me on a stage. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank General you, Gutlein, thank you for hanging out throughout this session as well. I will tell you, I, um, Carrie and I have uh, put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this kind of a mission set because we believe it's absolutely necessary, and it has been for years, and in all of its instantiations. And we've had the pleasure of meeting really good people because of it. Um, and we, I think, both firmly believe that this is a mission set, this is a cultural mindset, that quite frankly, US industry is up to the task to being able to meet, and that is gonna be at the heart of how the United States Space Force should be operating into the future to be able to meet its mission. Um, and I just want to end with that and with a word of gratitude for all that you are doing personally and professionally uh, and for everybody taking their time out of their schedule to be with here and to support us. Thanks. So